Good morning. I'm going to be in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, the text that was announced earlier, but you can also turn, if you want to, to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, because I'm going to go to that text as well. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. Just a beautiful, normal picture of the church that we're very accustomed to from the book of Acts. Not that you would notice necessarily, but I notice it because I'm having to speak through it. But my voice is a little challenged this weekend. There's a reason for that. I'm a West Kentucky boy living in Middle Tennessee, and I'm accustomed to all the flora and the fauna. I know all the plants that grow, and I'm pretty accustomed to it, and I, my system is adjusted very well to it. But last week, I spent the entire week up in Montana. How many of you have been to Montana? All right. You've been to Montana during the green season when everything's growing and the cottonwood is blowing all through the air? Well, that's when I was there. I had to speak nine times in six days. And it was supposed to speak ten times in six days, but had to cut it short because my voice just left me throughout all of it. But one of the things that I really deeply enjoyed being there is I was a part of Yellowstone Bible Camp. Now, if you're from that region of the country, and I know Dustin can identify with this, when you're up there in Wyoming and Montana and you're with the churches in that region of the United States, the churches are relatively small. And when they get together, they'll travel long distances to come together for sometimes days or weeks And these people, they plan their vacations around Yellowstone Bible Camp. And they come there for an entire week. They come from literally all over that region of the United States and southern Canada. And they enjoy, they deeply, deeply enjoy being with each other. In a very real sense, if you're thinking about the church, there are some times that our experience of church is what I would call special. Special. That was a special moment for them when they came together for that gathering for an entire week. They would get up in the morning, have breakfast, and they would have prayer around the flagpole, come in there and participate in Bible classes. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine quite what it's like to spend an entire morning in Bible classes, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, but that's what they did. And they were willing to hear that from me during that period of time. And I really, really deeply enjoyed that. But more than that, they participated in experiences that were just uh, central to their memory of faith as they've done this for years. These families have known each other from the time their children were very small, and most of the children were at a point of about graduating from high school, many of them making plans to move on and do different things. That was a special, special moment for them. You're experiencing a special moment in your life right now. When I walked in this weekend and I saw everything that was going on, I knew something special was happening, and indeed it is. It's Vacation Bible School. I know how many people it takes to carry off a Vacation Bible School. I would just be interested. How many of you, in one way or another, are involved in making sure that Vacation Bible School goes off well? Go ahead and raise your hand. Look around here. See there? It takes a lot of people to do VBS. Now, I know you already have somebody who can lead children's songs during VBS, but that's something that I really, really enjoyed. It was the one time when I was doing my full-time ministries that I I got to be kind of silly and it was just excusable, you know, for me to stand up and sing some of those really special songs. But more than that, I have a lot of memories in in my own childhood relative to vacation Bible school. Those are special moments, and they, they, they require an awful lot of activity and energy of the congregation to be able to pull it off. And you're, in, you're implanting, indelibly implanting into the lives of a lot of the special uh, children who will be here as part of that event, things that will stay with them for all of their lives as they, they look back on their experience of the church. So there are times that the church is special to us. When we have these events or other activities that underscore something unique 
in, on, the, on the annual calendar, most of you would probably be able to point to some special events in your spiritual life. I know that I can. And they were so, so important and, and remained that way for me. So there's one sense in which the church has a special nature to it because of things that happen. But there's another sense in which you can see the church not as extra special, but as just normal. Normal. The normal, regular, mundane things that the church does simply to be the church. There's one snapshot we have of that in the New Testament. I asked you to turn there to Acts chapter 2. I want to just read through this real quickly. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. And again, this is not going to be an unfamiliar text for any of you. You notice this is a description of the early church as they had experienced conversion and the preaching of the gospel. And this is the way they began to experience life together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now look at those elements. This is, these are the kinds of things that we do every week when we get together. Apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. I'm sure you've probably thought of this, but do you realize how that most of congregational life is the repetition of the same things over and over? In fact, most ministers would say that the difficulty they have is not being able to carry on ministry in its normal rhythms. It's building something that can capture the attention of people beyond that normal rhythm so that that normal rhythm doesn't become mundane. That's the difficulty. I may have shared with you before, can't remember whether I have or not, that most preachers feel a little bit of that uh, trap door underneath them from Sunday to Sunday, that thumbs up or thumbs down about the sermons that they preach because we have to work hard to gain attention. And there's some study to indicate that the churches of Christ are particularly demanding of their preachers in terms of what they want from week to week. But part of the difficulty we have with this is that sometimes we expect something a little more spectacular, something a little more uh, out of the ordinary just to keep and maintain our attention because the reality is when we come together, we're doing the same things from week to week. It's the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And that really is a kind of biblical pattern altogether. You go over to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Peter is doing everything he can to make sure that he's solidifying the spiritual growth of a group of people who are experiencing some hard times. And in verse 12... He says this to them of 2 Peter chapter 1, that he views it necessary to remind them of these things. He says, I will always remind you of these things. He's talking about the essential message that he's delivering to them. Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So he's telling them that what he's about to write about is not going to be new to them. It's something they've already heard several times over. You ever thought about how many sermons you've heard? You ever thought about how many Bible lessons you've actually listened to? If you've been a part of the church for 30, 40, 50 years, particularly, that's a lot of sermons, right? A lot of times that people have delivered on essentially the same themes over and over. And there's a reason for that. Because there are some things we need to be reminded of constantly, especially in a world that would distract us. And this is an incredibly distractible world. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I definitely do. I have a hard time being able to maintain my focus on spiritual things. It is not an easy task for me. 
I, I arrange my life and my daily schedule in such a way that I have various reminders that will appear in my calendar and on my screen to help me understand and remember the importance of set times during the day that I want to be praying, set times during the day that I want to go to key scriptures that are important for me at this particular stage of my spiritual life. Maybe someone I know that needs to be encouraged and I'm the one that God can use to make that encouragement. It's so easy to be distracted without those kinds of reminders. That's the way I structure mine. I don't know how you do your own in times of, in terms of doing what you can to make sure that you're paying attention to those things that God wants you to constantly keep before you, but it is so important to do. So yes, there are times that congregational life can feel special to us. When we have those moments where God's presence, the Holy Spirit's reality, the love and fellowship of our brothers and sisters in Christ is especially poignant. And, and we love those times, whether that be VBS or this special blood drive you have. You're reaching out to the community in a way that is actually going to be implanting deeply in the hearts of some people the realization that you're there for them, that you, that you love your community. All of those things are special. But then there is also just this sense in which church is sometimes just quite normal and repetitive. We keep on teaching the same things over and over again, keep on issuing the same reminders, keep on talking about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, celebrating that every time we take of the cup and the bread because we need those things. Think about what your life would be without those kinds of reminders. How many of you remember what you ate for dinner two weeks ago? I can't remember what I ate for dinner last night. Well, I do remember what I ate for dinner last night. I was at Majestic Restaurant over in Mayfield, and I ate a really good salad. But see, there's not enough time passed. But you can't remember what you ate two weeks ago on a Saturday night, unless it was really, really special. Now, those of you who cook the meal, you probably would love for them to be able to remember very specifically what you cooked for them, but most of us can't. But here's the reality. Even though you might not be able to remember what you got in that meal, you're better off for having received it. It may have been something just, you may have eaten buying a sausages. I don't know exactly what you ate during that meal two, two weeks ago on dinner. And it might not have been all that spectacular, but it was necessary for your nourishment. It may have been something that was just kind of a staple item within your cupboard. Sometimes a staple item for me on a time when Ann hasn't had time to cook and really doesn't have the energy to cook, and we definitely don't want me to be cooking within the family, is sometimes it's just going to be a Jethro bowl full of cereal. But it was nourishment. And sometimes congregational life is like that. It's just in the normal, repetitive rhythms of gathering, listening to teaching, participating in the Lord's Supper, praying for each other, being there for each other, giving a, a, a pat on the back, some encouragement, looking at another person and seeing and experiencing their smile and their investment in your life. Just normal. And you need that rhythm. Some of you have experienced what it's like to have to be outside of that rhythm for a period of time. Not because of something like COVID, which was a major disaster that each of us experienced in different ways during that time, but you know what it's like to be either ill or away from home, and you don't have your regular family of God that just feeds that sense of belonging and deep connection that you have with them and with your Lord. When you're away from that over a period of time, whether because of travel or whatever, it leaves a void in our lives. That's part of the reason why the Hebrews writer tells us over in Hebrews 10, we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves together because there is this sense in which we gain a real strong encouragement just by being present, just by being present and being present with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the regular, ordinary, mundane 
week in, week out functioning of the church. Sometimes it's special. Most of the time, however, it's just kind of normal. It's just week to week. It just unfolds. And we're better because of that. But there's another way of thinking about the church. Sometimes special, most of the time normal. But then try to think of it in terms of what God has in mind in an extraordinary kind of way. The text of scripture that was read at the beginning, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, underscores that very thing. It's one of Paul's special prayers in his letters. In fact, there are two very special prayers in the book of Ephesians. One's in the first chapter, and again here, this one in chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. But I especially like this one, chapter 3 and verse 14, because it ends with the doxology of praise. Listen again as I read this text, because it underscores something about how God's plan, his desire for the church is that there are extraordinary things that are accomplished through it. For this reason, Paul says, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then the doxology of praise. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. All right, here's something I want you to see. You may not know it, And you may not be experiencing it in your own mind right now. But you never know when God is taking something that is perhaps a little special or ordinary and is actually bringing about in his own way and in his own time something especially extraordinary that goes well beyond what you're asking or imagining in that moment. Are you hearing that? You don't know when that's happening. God is sometimes mysteriously working behind the scenes and takes things that we do that may seem like a normal deposit of faith relative to the church. Just something kind of a normal sermon, a normal Bible class, a normal song, a normal event, a normal small group. And it seems like to everyone else who's participating in it at that moment, and maybe even in the moments from week to week, that nothing really all that unique is going on. But God has a way of building out of that things that no one could ever have imagined happening. I think I told you the last time I was with you the story of a woman named Dorothy. I may not have mentioned it, but I think I did. In that story about Dorothy, a woman who had at some point in her adult life was stricken with rheumatoid arthritis and was not able to teach. She had to resign from her teaching role and eventually formed a ministry from her home. She was completely bedridden and she formed a ministry from her home that she called for those precious beloved persons behind bars. And you would go and you, you would go into her, her home and she would have a king size bed. And on one side of the bed was her telephone and everything that she used in her ministry. On, on the other side of her bed was a set of Bible study tools, a concordance, a study Bible, Bible dictionary, several other things. And what she had done 
is several years into her problem with arthritis where she wasn't able to get out, she decided to start doing Bible correspondence courses for people in the maximum security prison of the state of Alabama. And there were at least, there were at least dozens of conversions as a result of just her work with them. And they came to know her personally. And when they had phone time, this was a time when you had to wait in line and speak on a, on a pay phone just to be able to make contact with anybody from the outside. There were people who would be waiting in line just to talk to Dorothy and hear Dorothy in her broken voice to be able to read the Bible to them. And the phone was never hung up. The phone would be with one inmate, with Dorothy, listening to her read scripture. And then they would hand the phone to the next person. And they would hand the phone to the next person and to the next person. And she would read scripture to them. I don't know how many people are dotted all over the United States right now who have been released from prison who are making a difference in the lives of people that are a result of just those seeds that she sowed right there from her bed. She barely had the capacity to even use her fingers to press the large keypads on the phone that she would use as she would interact with people relative to her ministry. And when I think of someone like her, when she would describe to me the relatively mundane, non-special sort of things that she did, I'm thinking about the enormous impact that she had that went well beyond anything that she could have dreamed of. I've mentioned to you before, I grew up at the Northside Church in Mayfield, Kentucky. There was a woman there. Her name was Miss Cladine. She taught the fifth grade Bible class. Fifth grade, not fifth grade, pardon me, the five-year-old Bible class. I was about to get that wrong. That's a significant piece. When you were born and you started attending that church with your family, and for me, that was two weeks old and beyond, she started keeping a scrapbook on you of little pictures that she would take of all the special cookie and Kool-Aid events at VBS, I mean, you had several pages just as one little boy or one little girl where she started keeping that scrapbook on you. And then when you came into her Bible class, it was all displayed right there and you got to see pictures of yourself and the little things that she had collected about you. And she kept it even to the point that you graduated from high school and the last time I saw that scrapbook, it was a picture of my engagement to Anne as we were about to get married and move on into our lives. When she put that scrapbook together, it wasn't just for me. It wasn't for me to see it, really, although I did see it a couple of times. I knew what she was keeping on me, and she had on most of the children who grew up there at that church. This was her way of journeying her prayers for those people. Now, here's what I know. I know that there are times that I was completely unaware that Miss Claydine, in her normal, sometimes special, but most of the way normal, goings about as a Bible class teacher, there are times that God was especially active in my life because Miss Claydine was praying for me. She was keeping up with what was going on in my life. See, that's not just special. That's not just normal. Folks, that's extraordinary because of the kinds of things that God can do through that. You see, I, I suspect that there are times when I felt that special surge in my spirit that you kind of just know God is at work. And when I was a teenager or when I was a young man, it might have been that one of those times it was because Miss Claydine was praying for me. I don't know whether that's the case or not, but I do know this. God did things through that that not even she could anticipate. She would not even necessarily be able to journal and to, to list everything that God accomplished in my life and in the lives of all of those she prayed for apart from that. Neither could Miss Dorothy. Miss Dorothy, are you thinking about her involvement with all of those prisoners? 
Because see, her ministry even extended beyond that. Teenagers at the church got wind of the fact that she didn't sleep much at night. And so sometimes if they were up late and were discouraged, they would call Miss Dorothy and say, Miss Dorothy, would you read the Bible to me? And she would read the Bible to them sometimes for 30, 45 minutes, an hour at a time. That is extraordinary. You never know. So let me say this. You're sitting next to someone here this morning who in one level or another is special to you and you are special to them. I'm not asking you to look a little strange at each other. Some of you already kind of are looking back and forth at each other and saying, yeah, you guys are special to me. Some of you know that specialness. Some of you may not sense it. Some of you may be visiting right here today. You've never been here before and you're completely new to what's going on. But you know, you don't know, but what someone who is observing you on the other end of the auditorium has expressed, an exp has expressed to God, I'm so grateful that they're here. I don't even know their names, but God, thank you that you brought them here. Thank you that you let them find their way to the Broadway church. And regardless of what happens in their lives from this point, I just pray that you'll watch over them and that you'll suit to them what they need in their walk with you. You don't have any idea the extraordinary stuff that God could be doing right now through you or in you because you chose to be here at a normal, repetitive Sunday where a preacher got up and read Bible texts that you already heard probably 50 times or more singing songs that you could sing by rote if you had to because you've sung them so many times you could do it in your sleep. Sitting in the same pew, now don't tell me you guys don't have assigned pews. All churches have assigned pews, right? All churches have assigned pews. You guys are sitting in the same pew that I've seen you every time you've been, I've been here. You're sitting in the same pew. Okay, I, you, you guys do have de facto assigned. Jim, Jim's sitting in an assigned pew. Right? It's just right there, Jim and Dana, right there. Jim and Dana, I go way back to Lipscomb days, okay? You're sitting in the same place, listening to the same stuff, talking to the same people, circulating in the same lobby. Oh, pardon me, foyer sitting in the same Bible classes, looking at the backs of the same heads, feeling the imprint of that cushion on that pew that you have felt for years, and looking at the same stained glass windows, looking at the same color of the walls, looking into the same lights as they're descended down, you see, it can seem kind of ordinary, can't it? It can seem very, very repetitive. And to be honest with you, sometimes we can get a little critical of it. I mean, we can, let's just acknowledge, we can get a little critical of this mundaneness, wanting it to be a little more special than it is. But here's what we have to remember. God chooses to do ordinary. Through ordinary people, God chooses to do some extraordinary things that go beyond anything we can ask or imagine. Do you see that? And you never know you never know when it's happening with you. I got a note on Facebook, old people social media. <clears throat> I, I know it's for old people because the people who graduated in 1977 from Mayfield High School, we all stay in touch with each other on Facebook. Now, some of you are smiling here because I know you do the same thing. I'm looking around at you. Some of you are as old as I am or right around as old. In fact, I had somebody come up to me and say they graduated from Mayfield High School in 1975.
met somebody just earlier today here out in the lobby. I got a note. It was about a sermon I preached. You know how many years ago I preached the sermon? I actually have records. I'm a bit of a nerd. And so I actually have records as to when I preach certain things. And I look back on my records and I preached the sermon that she referenced. Get this. In 1987. 1987. I did not remember that she had asked for a copy of a quote that I used. I didn't remember that. But evidently, after my sermon, she asked for a copy of a quote I used about how God is constantly in process, building us, growing us, and that you should never look at a person tomorrow and assume you're seeing the same person that you saw the day before because God is at work and he's constantly changing and growing us. I didn't know how much she needed that at that point. But folks, this was two weeks ago. And that was 1987, where she said, Today I remember when a man God used one Sunday said this in the pulpit, and my life was forever changed. I never knew that. I didn't know that. Let me offer a word of encouragement to you as a church. You've been through an assessment, right? You've walked through some times where you're talking to each other about the future of your church. Folks, with all of your strengths and even with your weaknesses, do you realize, do you have any capacity to understand the difference this church makes all over the globe? All over the world, There are young men and young women in various places all over the place and right here in Paducah whose lives are better because of you. Don't lose sight of that. Don't let your discussions with each other about your future and your strengths and your weaknesses and your plans and that kind of thing. Oh, don't let it sidetrack you from the reality that God continues to do astounding things through this church because he continues to. One final story. You didn't know this. You didn't know it. But I told you the last time I was with you that I have a memory of the Broadway church when I was sitting somewhere right around in there And I listened to Dr. Harold Hazlip preach a sermon called The Impossible Dream. It's the first time I'd ever heard it. It was one of those have sermon, will travel sermons. I mean, he preached it all over the world, literally. I heard that sermon. It changed my life. And I was just sitting right there. 1976. That's a long time ago. You're doing the same thing now in lots of different ways, but you're doing it. Be encouraged by that and never let anything sidetrack you from the fact that with everything that you are, good and bad and indifferent, God does extraordinary things through the normal mundane things that you do that are occasionally special. Church, from three perspectives. Amen? I never know how a lesson's going to impact people, right? Like I said... I had no idea that that sermon in 1987 turned her life around. God used that in ways that I never would have anticipated. And I don't know but what a word of encouragement or just a kind sort of look in another person's eye that they've given you here today or a pat on the back 
or just someone's very presence. Or maybe the words that have been spoken. Maybe the scriptures that have been read. Maybe the songs that have been sung have given you some kind of indication in your life that there's time for a change. Your brothers and sisters in Christ here would love to be a part of that alongside you. Maybe you need prayer, special encouragement, or maybe today is a day that you say, I've decided I'm following Jesus. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to let the I'm going to let Jesus wash my sins away and the Holy Spirit come and take up residence in my life so that I can grow Godward. Could be a good time to do that. Let's stand and sing.